Happy Monday, everybody. Hey, man, I got a question. Sir? Uh, when, when, when you play the music, uh -huh. that's just what happens to be playing live on another uh, Twitch channel? No, I got a Spotify playlist here of all oh, okay. the uh, okay. most recent Monster Cat. In fact, people ask me a lot. Uh, if, you go, if you look on Spotify, Monster Cat, new releases. Monster Cat is one word. That's what I always do. Because I was, I was sort of lost in the question of like, how is it that every time we start, we're just a few seconds away from a drop? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, just... Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, Monster Cat's great. They, uh, I've talked about them before a little bit. You pay them like five bucks a month. They, they've actually like made it even nicer. Like five or ten bucks a month, and you get stream and YouTube friendly music. Nice. Um, we were using them for Scam Nation for a minute, uh, but they have some stipulations on when you have ads. Uh, oh, and got so it. We, when we have sponsors on there. Yeah. Uh, is that the kind of thing that it's worth reaching out directly, or that's just it's, a hard no? Uh, it, it would not be worth the money. I don't yeah. think. Yeah. I think. The estimate that I was quoted was like a hundred dollars per song per video. Oh yeah, no, that would be um, expensive. But now we use uh, Artlist. Artlist is great. Artlist is really good, and they are like two. It's like two hundred bucks a month, or two hundred bucks for the year. Yeah, and you just get everything all the time forever, mm -hmm. which is like, uh, yeah, you can't beat that. But uh, in fact, that's where we got. I was able to find that rock music for uh, for that Scam Nation intro that came out oh, last dude, week. Oh, dude! Uh, what's funny is I thought that was original because it was so right on the nose. Yeah. So that's that. Hey, Andrew, how are you doing, Andrew? She went on some. Was that almonds, raisinets, beef jerky? Beef jerky. All like right. a man. Pay out the beef jerky bet. Like an Indian brave who goes to outdoor world. <laughs> hey uh <clears throat> good news guys yeah what's up you won't have to stare at me wearing spacex shirts on every episode because the blue origin shop is open and i've already blew on like a hundred bucks buying shirts and hats ha <laughs> finally glad jeff was able to make some money our old friend jeff Old Jeffy. Yeah. Actually, I, I'm not even going to be mean because that dude pays for my health care. Oh, these are good shirts. These are cool. You know, yeah, he, uh, he, uh, he's my primary source of income. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turns out we're all pretty indebted to old, old, old JB. <laughs> Big Jables. Jables. <laughs> uh, welcome back, Andrew, also everybody that's yes yes thank you i'm almost through the thing with the thing oh nice but uh super super grateful for you guys letting me uh i i just was my my, my sleep schedule is horrible but yeah anytime you need it man I'm a, anytime <laughs> it's fun yeah. it's fun giving these guys stuff to talk about did you did you use the did you see the video of that orangutan no, we didn't use that yeah. one because no. I. But I, we we can show it here now. I think. Oh, is this? <laughs> so, uh, this is a clip from Three AW Radio. Yeah, this. Research is doing this. this new technology could eventually be introduced to zoos right around the world. But the visitors here at Melbourne Zoo, they may be lucky enough to experience it for themselves. <laughs> with the trial running sporadically throughout the rest of the month. It's just, just a, a face. He's just like, yeah. He's just ready. He's ready for his close up. <laughs> he's like, he knows there's something going on there. There's something interesting here, and he's like, hmm. I mean, the only thing missing is like a uh, a, a college fraternity hat and uh, and a and a natty light in his hand. He'd be every human in the background of every newscast ever. Did you, did you see there was? uh this like this if you type in um and i guess it's i i heard this is tragic but i don't know if it's true what happened afterwards to the the rangers but if you type in gorilla selfie have you ever seen this one uh gorilla selfie Something yeah like this so they have these workers, these guys were out there trying to protect gorillas, right? And so they're around them trying to keep them safe and stuff. And so there's this photo of this guy who's standing there. And <laughs> those guys, the gorillas, are just standing there in the background, you know, with the pot belly out. 
um uh but i've heard that like the you know i saw a thing and i don't know why i haven't seen it backed up whatever but like that those the, the park rangers got like killed or something later on by poachers mm. oh jeez by poachers yeah 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 i was at least hoping it would be the orangutans Okay, Brian. That's right. Well, I mean, no, no, no. Then I'd feel like, you know, Mother Guy is getting her revenge on humanity and all that stuff. But poachers. These are guys just... protecting these gorillas. These are guys protecting the gorillas. I know. These that's why I'm park bummed. Park... That's why I'm bummed. Are you, are, you, are you happier that it was poachers? You should be. I'm sadder that it's poachers. I just think that we're, yeah. they're gorillas. It's not a, a weird not place a to pick winners and losers, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm more sad because it was poachers. I don't understand where we disagree. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah, let's let's just poach our way on out of this conversation. <laughs> All right, I think I'm good over here. Oh wow! Oh. Shimabu said he was checking his phone when he noticed Nizaki and Nenzi. These are uh, two female gorillas that are in their protection in the national park, mimicking his movements behind him. So he took, <laughs> so they were mocking him. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh. All right. Yeah, it's ready to roll. Yep. Oh, wait. Ready. Hold on. I gotta. Oh, yeah, good catch. I had to remember which button to press. <laughs> All right, then I will uh, count you into the show in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. I noticed that uh, you and I both, Andrew, are working on our Fletch uh, hat wings. That that little, I, I never knew that that was a thing, but 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 our hair on the sides has grown so long that it's starting to, to feather on up. Uh, yeah, two things about that. Uh, hold Justin Robert Young. No hat wings here for <laughs> old Polly Pomade. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. I got the, uh, this, this, what, this used to be an undercut, but now it's just a very messy crew cut. It's just a regular cut. That's no, just hair. That's <laughs> <laughs> just a regular hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Fletch Wings, uh, number one, fact. Uh, number two, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I moved into my new apartment right as the event started and i have not found my comb so i am two months now no comb has touched this hair <laughs> i uh, well, I, I keep having to record you know like ads and interstitials and stuff and um uh, scam nation episodes but i haven't gotten a, a haircut in nearly two months so my hair gets increasingly trump like i notice especially in the back where it sort of I... like swoops up with this little curl Brian. at the back it's it's damn luxurious, I must say. <laughs> the, the way it is, it is. It is. No, it, it's look. It looks good. Uh, Keep well, running your fingers through there, Brian. It's it's one of those things where it's like I'm torn between my impulse to get a haircut as soon as I can, but also realizing that in my lifetime it will never be more socially oh. acceptable to look this schlubby than it is right now. No, you need to go full Brad Pitt, kind of like let it when he let it kind of the come down kind of thing, and just just you know, kind of that. I mean, know, I, I feel like like there's some kind of like over the hump I could get here. Oh, right? you could do this. You could do this, Brad See, Pitt. Right, right. You yeah. could actually. Do All this. right, I'm gonna keep on going. Brad Pitt, then. long hair. For those playing along at home, just Google Brad Pitt, long hair. <laughs> Legends and of the Fall, man. That... Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> hmm. Totally pull it off, you know, because you've also got the blonde hair too. So you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh. All right. So, yeah. uh, welcome to uh, to Hair Club for Weird People. The the wings kind of <laughs> give you a gym from the office sort of look. Well, and and, yeah. I, and I feel like it has to go just a little bit farther. Yeah, you In need fact, a few more um, uh, I went back and I started watching like early '80s miniseries and TV show, and Bonnie accused me of only watching it because my hair was starting to feather out, like it was the early '80s. And uh, <laughs> and I'll be damned if I don't look like half of the visitors from V. Uh, but <laughs> so today we actually. Bonnie started to teach me how to feather out my hair in kind of this bozo kind of way. Uh, but uh, in fact, there was a character, if you look up Brian from V, that uh, that that uh, I, 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 in my fantasies, I would grow up to look like. So I think I'm trying to to look like I, Brian from V. I just like Brian takes off his hat and it's and it's all it's this swept sort of kind of coif sort of look, though. I take it off and I'm like, 
It's like behind your desk, all your computer cables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Damn you, Brian. <laughs> damn it. Damn. I regret nothing. Yeah, I hope there's a lice outbreak in your studio. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Mostly. Hey, gentlemen, uh, really exciting news. Genuinely very cool. NASA announced last week that they have finalists for what is called for the Artemis program. As you know, there's a mandate for NASA to try to put two astronauts on the moon by 2024, which, of course, is a very ambitious schedule. But the way they decided they were going to try to do it was reach out to private enterprise and to different companies and contractors and say, can you make this happen? So the first round was they had proposals from different companies who came in to say, this is how we want to do this. Normally, what NASA does is they say, hey, we want a rocket that's this tall, uses these engines, that meets these specifications. Oh, look, our favorite contractors already have that. <laughs> Nobody else bother. We got it covered. And then you end up with the SLS, which, by the way, turns out each engine, which they need five of for the main stage, is now going to cost like $180 million. That's neither here nor there. Point is, for the Artemis program, they reached out and said, hey, we're looking for proposals, and we're going to fund them. To You have 10 months to take it as far as you can, and then we'll evaluate and then look at the next round of funding. So they announced the winners of this first round. There were three winners that are going to get funding to take it forward. Uh, one of them is called the National Team, which is actually Blue Origin and some other contractors, I believe, including Lockheed, where Blue Origin is going to build the Lunar, Lock, Lunar Lander section. Lockheed will build, like, I think the human section, and then they're going to use... Uh, you know, a heavy lift booster. I think they could use a couple different ones. Another company that won uh, a grant, uh, and these are like the hundreds of millions of dollars. Some of them are more, some of them are less. Is a company called uh, Dianetics. Oh. <laughs> and we're, we're like, wow, um, that's ambitious. It turns out that it's a company that's worked Dianetics, which has worked before with NASA. And they're, uh, they've had a subsidiary called Lido. So they've done a lot of different sort of background projects with NASA stuff that, like, I've never even been aware of. But, you know, you look at all the hardware that goes into things like space launches and, you know, space station, et cetera. So they've got a grant. Uh, they got a, they won money to try to develop the next stage. And they've got their proposal, which is pretty cool, which is this sort of uh, – looks like it's got bunny ears when it lands. You know, and it's got this sort of, like, two – it's going to have, like, the, the human module with these two tanks on either side. So it's kind of slung between them, which is neat. And the third recipient is SpaceX. Well, hold on, wait, wait. Let, let's like, just because this is an audio only podcast, uh, uh, it is Dianetics, not Dianetics. Like it is spelled right. differently than the canonical Scientology tome. When you hear every person I've heard who's talking about space pronounces it subliminally. Oh, I yes, yeah. Without yeah. a doubt, there's no way you read that and you don't think is this some Scientology stuff? But, or you but, say, uh, just, oh yeah, Dianetics. Oh yeah, there we go. I, I yeah. Think, yeah. And it will be launching from a volcano. So there is yeah. that. <laughs> so the third recipient is SpaceX and SpaceX proposed, and this was, had been unseen to anybody outside of SpaceX, you know, the fans and stuff of it. They proposed their lunar lander, which they want to take Starship and basically do a version of Starship, which is designed to land on the moon and has uh, a different sort of design to it with solar arrays, et cetera. It doesn't have the reentry fins that the other Starship has. But they plan on trying to propose this. And what's significant about this, it's a very radically different architecture than what's been proposed before. This would be fully reusable. This would be a fully reusable architecture. And the amount of payload that it would bring to the moon surface, the lunar surface, would be 10 times what everybody else can. In fact, there's images where they show this thing next to all the other proposals. And the comment I thought was funny was like, so what's it going to do? Bring them all there too? Ha! <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's like, uh, you know what? We could all be winners. You guys just hop yeah. in the back seat and, oh. and we'll be there. It is it is so. wild to to look at it and think in terms of, uh, you know, I know it was a big deal during the Apollo 11 landing to make sure that they could find a flat enough area to land on. Um, that becomes even more important in a, a SpaceX when you're landing a, you know, what, a three or four story building. You know, you want it to be on, on flat terrain. Uh, I got to assume they begin with the ending in mind and they know exactly where they're headed. But I, I, I just picture this this horrific bummer of a scenario of him landing on on tilty land. <laughs> but I'm sure I'm sure they thought oh, of that. They got, they got radar and stuff and all that. But but a problem that was that had been posed prior to this. And uh, actually, I did an interview 
uh, thanks to it was with Brian uh, of Andrew Heaton, we talked to Dr. Robert Zubrin, and he had been critical of SpaceX's Starship being used to land on the moon because the Starship engines are so powerful that as they land, they would create a crater and send so much ejecta up that could cause a problem. And if you look at what's if you look at what SpaceX is proposing for this, go back to the image there, you can see their solution. And that is they have a group of thrusters which are two thirds of the way up. So it would appear that what they're going to do is they're probably gonna do a, uh, an entry burn and they're gonna probably fire their engines to slow down at a certain altitude and then when it gets close enough, those might be like their, their super Draco thrusters or what have you. And Zurban had said that, you know, it said that, oh, you know, RCA, the reaction control th gas hit thrusters wouldn't be powerful enough on Twitter like two days ago, but the super Dracos are, they're hypergolic. They use the same sort of fuel that the other one of the other landers was going to use. So I think they've probably thought this through, but, but yeah, Brian, to, the, to your whole point though, about like landing on the moon's hard. Cause even if you have a flat surface, you kick up all this debris moon, moon dust is extremely gritty. They said that it would work its way even to the astronauts shoes, which sounds incredible. So um, these are all things we have to solve. Yeah, in uh, one of the things I really dug in the Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars trilogy was uh, how uh, it was sort of a running gag that everyone would call it, uh, you know, Martian dust. And they're like, no, they're not dust, they're fines. And then they would talk about just how troublesome fines were, how they would find their way into everything. And it was like a constant uh, issue with everybody. So uh, I, I would imagine the same thing could happen with moon dust or yep. fines. <laughs> So, but it's exciting though. So 2024, what do we think about that date? Um, uh, bit, bit, you know what, man, if you asked me four years ago where this country would be right now, I would be nowhere close to correct. So, uh, you ain't even going to get me to make a prediction about 2024. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, uh, who knows, obviously, uh, uh, Stranger things have happened in terms of, uh, you know, government funding of stuff. And if this is a NASA operation, hopefully that continues to uh, uh, move forward. But I do think that considering we do have the cheap space flight, like there are still things that we can learn on the moon. And uh, uh, I think that that would be a sign that we have gotten our exploration to a point where this is possible. I, I do think that it's it's certainly worthwhile. It'll be fun to see. I mean, I hope, you know, it's it's smart, I think, taking the strategy by letting these companies come up with the different approaches towards doing it. And I think in 10 months or whatever, I think that's the number I heard they're going to then assess. And I've heard that they may actually fund two more projects to go forward from there. So it won't just be one out of three, but two out of three. And, and I would like to see if SpaceX can do what they're doing. I'd like the idea of that, you know, that be one of the alternates because it's the most ambitious approach, but it would be great to have, you know, just a really heavy lift capability on the moon. So. Hell yeah. You know what else could use some heavy lift? This podcast. Uh, yeah, that would be uh, patreon.com slash weird things. If you head on over to the weird things, Patreon, well, you're going to find a place where you can go ahead and give us a little bit of coin. Obviously, these are tough times, and we appreciate everybody who has continued past our uh, uh, the first of the month. Uh, everybody who continues to, to support this, make sure that we come out here each and every Monday and give you a fresh new episode. And if you are a patron, well, you go ahead and get uh, the After Things podcast early. You get a custom RSS feed. Come on. What are you waiting for? Patreon.com slash weird things. You know... One of the things I think we may have joked about, like, you know, what it would have been cool to do while, let's say, like Disneyland and Disney World are abandoned is the idea of like, I don't know, going there. Well, somebody did it. Wait, some they, guy. They, they just hopped a fence. So, some guy hopped a fence or two and made his way to Discovery Island at Walt Disney World, which is this large island, which is in the middle of a lake there, which that at one point was going to be the island that they were going to build like the mist theme park that was rumored about and so some dude decided he was i, just I know that i know there. this island we we stayed at uh, uh fort wilderness last time we were there and we took the the ferry right by it and we uh, we got to gawk at it and we were told about how it used to be uh, the home of vip tours and that there was all kind of wild animals up there and all there uh uh that's amazing 
So he spent, it was like a couple days there. And in his defense was like, oh, like I just thought it was tropical paradise. I didn't know it was closed off. Right. <laughs> I mean, which, yeah. Uh, for those of you who have not been to Walt Disney World, like there is no mistaking that you are crossing into Walt Disney World property. Like that, that is a very expansive piece of land and nobody around that area doesn't know what they're doing. It is a smaller island than you would expect. Like, uh, you could probably run around it in maybe 10 or 15 minutes if, if there is a proper jog jogging trail. Um, it, uh, it It's really bizarre because you can see it's like half developed. They had some stuff that they clearly had plans and ambitions to do something with, and then it didn't go anywhere. It's one of those things where I just would assume there are cameras everywhere, even if you don't see them. Well, that's the interesting thing about Disney World is that where there are cameras, some places there are lots of cameras and stuff on rides and stuff where they worry about people like, you know, falling into stuff. Other places they aren't because like on an island like that, you've got to maintain them. You've got to keep control of them. And it's also a thing that they, they're not really worried necessarily about people doing that. And cameras still to this day kind of require somebody watching them. So, you know, um, there is, it is a very heavily, you know, you know, monitored facility, but um yeah, we're seeing some Apparently. footage right now from 2017 of people kind of gawking at the desiccating remains of uh, of the island. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, it's uh, Bright Sun Films, which does a lot of their, like, the abandoned series, which is pretty cool. So they'll show all these different kind of abandoned theme parks and stuff. So that's a cool place to check. And, I mean, the, the amount of YouTube channels and content on all things theme parks and Disney now is insane. You know, there was yeah, a lot. Yeah, you want to know what this kind of just looks like lost. Like it, yeah. it, it just has that like overgrown, there was something here uh, uh, kind of vibe to it. But that's, that's, uh, that's crazy. And so this is, uh, Brian, so it was in between Fort Wilderness and like Magic Kingdom? Or? Yeah, yeah. There's a ferry that you take over and you go right past it. Right, right before you take over, the, you take the uh, the water bridge over the highway, which is really surreal when you're on a boat and you see yeah. cars to your right that go in an underground thing underneath your boat and then come out the other side. That's funny. Yeah. One of the fun things to do, too, is if you uh, next time you and your family plan a trip to Walt Disney World, go try the speed boats, the little boats you can drive around. Yeah really fun really 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 fun it's one of those things that you know you'd see like ah i'm gonna do that some year I i'm gonna do that sometime and then uh last time I was at disney with my girlfriend i said you know what let's let's actually go do that and it was such a delight to ride those around because you just get free control you can ride around and you can see parts of uh actually there was a, the river country do you guys know that was one of the disney disney world original parts of the park oh i did i didn't know that yeah, there's so you see that that yeah, was this, they that. had this there was this thing called like I think Disney called look up like River Country Bryce, I think that's what it's called. And it was back in the seventies, they had this whole kind of like another sort of water park there that was this sort of like long, lazy, like laying the water go around, whatever. And it was right off of that island. The problem was is like it was like all fresh water and not like the chlorinated water that they use. Oh. And, and yeah, they that seems had, like a recipe for disaster. And apparently was. And so they had a few outbreaks and stuff and things like that <laughs> so uh they eventually just stopped doing that but yeah we're looking at some video of them now like you know river country and it looks so much fun and just that fresh fresh clean water none of that you know uh chlorinated water <laughs> wow yeah it's funny even even in the uh commercial you can kind of just see the water look kind of like green and brackish <laughs> but y you know what's funny is that's exactly the i mean the schlitterbahn in uh, south of austin is completely fed by the colmall river and it's yeah, it looks roughly the same as that but it but it's all fresh water uh and it's it's actually pretty great but brian you said river yes this is a stagnant Florida lake. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have, having grown up there, uh, the canals were fine. You saw a pond, mm, I think twice. Yeah, now yeah. we're getting the photo of the of the bacteria in the lake. So, I don't trust uh, them. Working. I don't trust ponds. I don't like yeah. them. To, yeah, uh, but... They're up to something. They're planning, plotting. 
scheming. But it's he's pawns. But it's serious because you could be riding along, you know, in your little boat, and you you see parts of this thing like this totally falling apart, rotting away, whatever. And it's very un Disney, you know, to see that. So kind of just fascinating. Uh, here's a cool research paper and. What's interesting about this is that it's more of a, hey, here's a thing to think about. Not necessarily we think this is legit, but let's not ignore the possibility. We've talked before about uh, Planet Nine, the idea that there could be this, you know, uh, since Pluto got demoted, a ninth planet way at the outer edge of our solar system, something that could be like, you know, five to 10 times the size of the Earth, you know, as far as like 500 astronomical units away. Yeah. And if, if and, I remember correctly, uh, the assumption is based entirely on on uh, uh, stuff not matching our gravitational predictions. Like it's like, well, it seems like something's causing this all to not line up right. Yeah. Well, the well, if you look at like the Kuiper Belt objects, it's actually like they seem to be pulled towards something like there's something that seems to make them instead of being random or their distribution sort of spread out evenly. There seems to be what is best explained is our understanding would be some object that's pulling them in one direction. And there could be other explanations. There's been a lot of different, you know, but the, we keep coming back to like, well, if you saw this, you'd be like, well, there's something out there pulling on it. The problem is, is it's so hard to see. But this paper says, hey, uh, by Edward Witten, uh, Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, with the uh, wonderful street of Einstein Drive, by the way, Edward Witten suggests Let's consider the idea that there could be a black hole in the outer solar system. Now, that doesn't huh. seem like the craziest thing on the planet to me, or off the planet, as it were. Yeah, I was going to uh, say. <laughs> I, I guess black holes are defined just basically by, by the steepness of their gravity well. I mean, outside of that, they're like any other celestial object. They, they have a pole, or... <laughs> yeah, they would have... If you had... You know, you could take you know, uh, your, your truck and you could collapse that into a black hole and from 15 feet away, it wouldn't be any more gravitational pull than your truck right. has, you know? Um, and, but you know, you start getting super close to it and then that's when sort of problems arise and all of a sudden you start touching it and then all of a sudden it starts, you know, so that's, that's sort of the, 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 you know, that's a, yeah, the, the, yeah, the right way to look at kind of a black hole is the idea is, it has as much gravitational pull as the mass that goes into it. Can you imagine, take... like, let's say, let's say after we become a type two or type three civilization, like there's like an environmental cleanup. Let's say it is a black hole, and it's like all of a sudden there's space environmentalists that are saying, "Hey, man, we're about to finish the Dyson sphere. Let's say we use that energy to move this gravitational ob object to uh, just let's sweep that black hole out of our system." And and uh, be, be, because much like um, you can divert an asteroid, let's say an asteroid's mm -hmm. coming to planet Earth, uh, one of the ways to keep it from smashing into Earth is send a gravitational object to just sort of hang out near the the asteroid to just sort of s mm, steer it off course because it's going to be attracted to the spaceship just like the spaceship is attracted to it. Uh, what if what if we had some kind of massive effort to do that to just sort of yeah, no black holes in this system? Get out of here, <laughs> black holes, get. But do you see what they, uh, Bryce just had the headline, which said how big it might be. Uh, the size of a baseball. Holy cow. The mass of five Earths, the size of a <laughs> baseball. Yeah. So uh, in order to move it, you're going to need something that's, you know, the significant mass to get it to move. Uh, yeah, but but, but but even then, I guess if it's a thousand year project. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, the scale you're talking about, sure. Oh, yeah. for sure, for sure. Yeah. No, yeah. no, I'm, yeah, I'm just saying it's a, but it's, it's, yeah, that's the thing. But think about, yeah, that is a crazy thing to think about. That's five times more massive than Earth, and it's just the size of a baseball. Like, yeah. you know, you're flying through space, and that goes through your hole. Well, you're part of it now. <laughs> yeah. Batter up. So, so and the, the challenge, of course, is if there is something of that size, how do you spot it? Because... It's you're never going to notice it, including stars, because it's so damn small at that scale. And, you know, you would have to start looking for more and more evidence of. I could the interference picture. We've talked before about the idea of a larger than a planetary sized telescope. The idea that just like the very large array is a bunch of radio telescopes arranged in sort of a triangle, you know, pointed out. And then between all those data points, they're able to get a virtual dish Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, several miles wide. Uh, we've talked about a series of satellites that could be orbiting planet Earth that could essentially create a virtual lens 
the size of bigger than the planet Earth. I, I could imagine that if you have a detailed enough map of the stars, you wouldn't, as you said, uh, it's very unlikely you would ever see a baseball sized object occlude a star. But I think you could track the visual distortions of the gravity well, right? I don't think, I don't think if it's the size of a baseball, I don't think you're going to get a distortion that's going to be that significant. Understand or, that or like the mass of five earths or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's just it. Is it is it like, we don't, you know, uh, uh, you know, in your occlusion is just, it's just not going to, it's not going to be bending light that far out. I guess so, uh, the most I can and picture was... and, and this now we're back to like a thousand year project. I could see some kind of massive dusting um similar to mm -hmm. like uh, on a small level the way we would dust for fingerprints you could i could imagine a bunch of nanoparticles with a particular signature being released uniformly and then you watch the way they turbulent uh as they or the turbulence as they distribute with their signature but but again that's that's a multi uh hundred year project i would guess yeah, the, the challenge, of course, though, is the further away you get, the more spread out they are. And, uh, you know, I think, but to, to that point, though, looking at existing objects, Kuiper Belt objects, et cetera, probably would be, because there is a gravity, even though it's the size of baseball, it has the mass of five Earths, so you're going to be watching it disturb stuff. So, uh, you know, looking at other objects and just using your, you could use your telescope array and say, let's start mapping all these things out there, and let's start getting to a, a granular level and see how things are being disrupted. And you know, you probably could. And then uh, this pro this paper mentions using like uh, uh, laser powered spacecraft like Project Starshot, which is actually out of uh, Dr. Phil Lubin's lab, um, uh, which would be an interesting way to sort of probe it. So, yeah, that's um, one of those things that sounds um, untenably tedious in in human terms. But we've we, once we wrap our minds around the scale of tedium that AIs can handle, you know, give give an AI five years and it will individually map every single thing. Uh, what was um uh, man? I can't remember. One of Edwin Hubble's discoveries was this remarkable star field where where out of all these thousands of stars, he noticed that just one had moved <laughs> just a teeny bit or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then that, or maybe it might have been the discovery of one of the planets on there. But uh, but something that just seems unreal for a human to discover is 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 child's play for an ai yeah and that's yeah if you get that that's the uh you know where they would use the whole flashing back and forth between those plates looking for that and yeah you know, and once you could start having look at the patterns of a lot of things all at once then yeah anything you know it's 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 really an exciting area to be in um and uh we will we'll see we will see uh what happens next but i i just for me reading about the idea of oh well, yeah there could be you know a an entire you know black hole hanging out the outer edge of our solar system it's like cool That's yeah I, re I remember when um uh what, what what's the what's the uh ato the super collider or no it's not a super collider whatever the 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 thing in switzerland uh yeah, Hadron 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 super yeah, collider yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, they there was talk about like uh you might make a black hole and i remember being so confused by the response of yeah but it'll it'll be so small it'll just evaporate and i'm just like wait what that's not what i think of a black hole doing yeah yeah they've had it some just pretty kind of like it just traces away like a fart Yep, it's like yeah. it's like oof. That was really embarrassing. That oh, black God. hole. Oh, uh, Steve, did you, you keep black hole <laughs> in here? Say, does somebody open up the vents. Give us twenty minutes. Oh. It's fine. Right, but it is it is a good example though of how there is a disconnect because one of one of the things I'd say that like I think in science writing, which can be frustrating. One is scientists are very knowledgeable about their domain, but once they speak outside of the domain, you start to realize that often they don't. They know just as much as you know. You can just ask your mechanic, Politics. and they would have us. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, even 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 a physicist asks answering biology questions. You know, like like an, an astronomer answering questions about you know aspects of stuff. But you, I see this where all of a sudden we're like, wow, they're. They know as much as just a person who's kind of smart and follows this sort of stuff, but their expertise is just, you know, Limited. very narrow. There's the there's the joke about like, you know, this guy's talking to this this man asking what he does, like, oh, I study red ants, da da da. I'm entomologist. He goes, Oh, cool, about your wife. Oh, you know, she studies, you know, uh, you know, uh entomology too. Oh, really? What is she? Well, she studies, you know, ants. Oh, really? You guys must have a lot to talk about. He goes, Oh, no, no, she studies black ants. Just totally different. <laughs> totally different. Um 
and science writers. Science writers have to cover a lot of different topics, and you got to seem like you're credible. So when you read a lot of science coverage in newspapers and stuff, we kind of assume they know what they're talking about. But we've talked about this before when uh, Murray Gelman and Michael Crichton were talking about they realized that, like, man, this, they know nothing about what they're doing. And you read a lot of science coverage, and you start to get into a topic like, man, they don't know what they're talking about. And my heart goes out to them because it's like, hey, there's a new research paper today. Break it down and explain it to people. Right. Like, um, okay. Also, make it so. super clickable and make it one of your six posts this afternoon. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. G give us a really, you know, attention-grabbing headline, which may misrepresent what's in it. <laughs> you know, so uh, it's happens, that's but. a weird phenomenon, and it's actually kind of, uh, you know, obviously pretty prescient now, considering that we are kind of we have a perfect storm of a lot of emerging science. Uh, a lot of people that have no time that have all the time in the world on their hands that are smart that are now all trying to process this like coronavirus thing. And it's just, uh, it's, it's hard. It's a full-time job just parsing out what's worth reading and what is actively making you dumber by like the smartest people that you follow and know, like be they of, of all different stripes. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's, it is frustrating. Cause you know, we, we look for, answers and stuff and then we see that somebody's got you know an md in back of their name or whatever and they're maybe an emergency room physician or like oh i'm gonna see this and then you listen to them say something to like man this person has no grasp of statistics and you're like and i'm i'm concerned and scared because i'm listening to people say completely contradictory things but they all have the category of expert and yeah uh it's you know, well, and, and that's the Murray Gelman effect, as as delineated by Michael Crichton, which is um, we have the ability to say, oh, well, they clearly don't know what they're talking about in this one subsection. Turn page. They must be an expert in this, though. And and of course, you know, they're all just doing their best to translate uh, the press, the AP releases. Yeah, and we and we all sort of fall back on the way we want the world to be. Like I know in my Twitter feed, I get two very sort of hot takes on what's going on right now. And it's interesting because I see my ideology likes this interpretation of stuff. So I'm going to give you this. And then the other side, like, well, my ideology likes this interpretation of it. So you're stupid if you don't see this. And All right. it's like, uh, this yeah. is a very rare event in space, uh, in, in, in weird things history. Uh, we've, we've, we've talked about hard science. We've talked about some weird science for one of the rare times and I think the chat room has it. Spin Dash Twelve wants to know, Elon Musk. What was this week? <laughs> like this is this is somebody who is not Andrew bringing up I, Elon Musk. <laughs> I I will give you one short, simple explanation. Relationships. His girlfriend Grimes is due to give birth today. Oh really? <laughs> yes. Elon Elon is waiting. He's in a house with five kids and his girlfriend, who's about to pop with a kid. That's all you need to know right there. <laughs> Humans, am I right? <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah. So uh he he yeah, he had a he went on Twitter and Elon be Elon, okay? And, and this is I tell people like like I I I when Elon says something crazy, I am heavily invested, full disclosure here, and I feel it. I really feel it because you know I I, I can look at that, ah, this is the day at which I never have to work again. Uh, uh, you know, five more years of working and whatever. Like I feel it every time he he's, says that. He's the, the 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 perpetual Puxatani fill of your life. It's like every time oh, you yeah. think winter's over, he pops up and sees a shadow. Yeah, I I let me put it this way: like when he took that hit on the Joe Rogan show, it probably would have been cheaper for me to have taken the fall for him and paid all the court fines. <laughs> 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 no, it was me. I did it. You know. <laughs> if they had gone whatever be prosecuted anyway, but point is um he 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 I, i'm going what the hell is going on you know so he made a comment so several things and then he's he's obviously very frustrated by uh the uh shelter in place etc because also like a lot of business owners you know when your business is kind of effectively shut down you're looking at this from a, a different way than other people are and then he he also talked about like, hey, I'm gonna sell all my stuff. I'm selling all my stuff, all my possessions, all those sort of things. 
and people are like what and like and like I, I have an idiot he's just stock market's doing great but he made a comment like i think tesla stock's too high okay like, wait, well, which, that, that was the one that raised my eyebrows all the way to the back of my head didn't he get slapped <laughs> for talking about tesla stock at all like isn't that the red line no no is he's not supposed to talk about whether well, he or not can, he he can talk about it they have to go through when he talks about the things board really yeah there is there has to be approval or whatever but offering an opinion about it whatever and also it's going to be well, there will be lawsuits, I'm sure, um, but a CEO who can say, yeah, I think our stock is a little bit over, is highly priced right now, he can say that. And there's an argument to say that it, it is, although as a shareholder, I'm like, well, let it be highly priced. Um, and I'm like, well, here's the thing, Elon, keep your mouth shut about that. You don't have to sell all your houses, <laughs> you yeah. know, but he he's, I, he's really in a... It comes down to the Mars thing. He's really, really in on this, and he wants to focus full time, Tesla sustainable, and then just go run with Starship and really build this galactic empire. Yeah, he's going crazy though. Right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I just mean like, like in uh, in in the same way that we all are in quarantine. Well, however Elon Musk's brain works, and however much it is being. Uh, pressure cooked by five kids and a pregnant uh, pop star girlfriend. Uh, like I, I can, I can only imagine that there are uh, uh, so th th there's there's some wear and tear there, and he is we are we are seeing exactly that 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 leaked out on Twitter and and apparently during the earnings call because the earnings call was a little bit of a wackadoodle moment too. What and I'm like. I'm like, yeah, welcome to Planet Elon. This is not the first time this has happened when he gets stressed out, where we get, you know, the the the, the crazy sort of stuff. And I'm like, this, this is uh, ironically one of the more relatable Elon outbursts. People are like, yeah, man, I feel you. I want to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm just saying that, like, yeah, he was crazy from the start, guys. I'm gonna, you know, like the story I love is is. Uh, I think it's Reed Hoffman, you know, one of the PayPal co-founders talks about visiting SpaceX and Elon's showing his buddy around and says, over here is the Falcon 9. Now the next generation, the Starship, is going to be the one that we're going to use to go to Mars and build the colony. And Reed's like, man, I just found the upper limit for ambition. <laughs> I mean, yeah, spoiler and, alert, and, still not the upper limit. <laughs> well, but I mean, as far as a realistic person who could say, I'm going to do this, you know, if... If, you know, my, my buddy from high school tells me I'm going to build a colony on Mars, like, great, good luck with that, buddy. Uh, you didn't finish your porch, you know. But when this guy says it, and you're like, wow, this is a realistic thing this guy may actually do. And that's oh, my gosh. Thing, it, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing all this stuff from the turn of the month here where he's just <laughs> – he's losing his mind. He wants to go outside. He's just like, please. <laughs> yeah. So – uh, yeah, he was back to talking about Minecraft though last night. So I feel like he's uh he's calmed down a bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean cuz we don't know we don't know like, you know, was there just a fight over what they're going to watch on Netflix and stuff, you know, and then he's like, "Ah, eh, I'm just going to mess around on Twitter." <laughs> you know, and you know, a couple of gym beans later, and another thing. <laughs> and it's like, "Oh jeez." Don't know. Don't know. Hey, you guys want to do some picks? Yeah, I got a weird sure. pick for you guys. Weird pick for weird things. Um, season ahead. two of the Gimlet podcast series, Conviction. I am currently uh, most of the way through it. Uh, I, I don't know what was in season one, but season two is some fantastic investigative reporting covering the story of the satanic panic worldwide. And it starts with... Where it all began, it, it begins by sort of calling their shot with a particular case in San Antonio where uh, there's a family, the Quinnies, um, and you hear audio sound bites of a kid telling these, or this adult kid telling these insane stories uh, about, you know, digging up corpses with his dad and being forced to eat it and all that stuff, and how his dad was a, a Satanist and everything, and it's, it's very striking. And then it, it as, as good investigations do, it takes you back to that time, makes you understand uh, how the satanic panic emerged, how it resembles so many other uh, purity spirals, uh, witch hunts, what have you, uh, how it started off as a campaign 
to believe the children. And there are countless number of children who whose lives are better because somebody, some psychologist said, hey, it's very unlikely that if your kid says they were touched inappropriately, that they're just making that up out of nowhere. That's not something that kids tend to do. And as a result, a lot of people who would otherwise brush off things being said by kids took them seriously. And there was a lot of actual predators that were, that were caught and family members who were inappropriately touching kids. Uh, but that is a double bind scenario where of course, if you only believe the kids and if you push against them and then they push back, that means you just have to push harder until they finally admit that they uh, really were victims. And then it talks how that started to lead to false arrests. And there's one particular county in Los Angeles where uh, they had, um, I want to say, 350 cases that they said where kids have been molested. And it's like they ran out of people to blame. And so families hopped in the car and went camping, which is uh, air quotes for ran away from town because they felt like they were just going to be caught next. Spoiler alert they were caught next and and went to jail falsely wow. and uh uh and then and then there comes a particular moment that they play audio of what is alleged to be the first seminar that anybody uses the word satan and then it kicks it into overdrive that's when everything goes into fifth gear and then for the next seven years everything's ramps up and up and up and you get to this insane story and um uh, i am sure everyone on this podcast knows that i have a particular interest but i will save that part of the story for another day because i don't think we've really talked about it on the air but uh but it's fascinating it's a fantastic story well represented they talk about the nature of manufacturing false memories and um uh, when you hear the investigations, the interviews with these kids, it is heartbreaking to hear the kids say, no, no, that's not what happened. And to hear these adult detectives say like, Oof, well, well, your memory is not as good as Susie's. Susie already said it was like, are you sure? Let's, let's think about that again. And he just keeps on going until finally the kid says, uh, yeah, they touched me here, I guess. I don't know. And uh, uh, it's, it's crazy and heartbreaking, not for the faint of heart, but very, very well done. Yeah, it sounds fascinating because that was such a a scary thing because, you know, you we went through, you know, uh, over the longest time is, you know, silent victims not being able, not being heard, people ignoring a problem with a large scale problem and then addressing the problem. And then, you know, you with a satanic panic, you had the confluence of, you know, the the, the, the crazy fundamentalist, you know, Christian groups that saw Satan everywhere. And then out of from, you know, crazy town this form of therapy that you know uh, came from sort of an entirely different sort of you know part of the philosophical spectrum that's like no children don't lie and if you talk to them long enough you get these memories and stuff and then overzealous cops and the next thing you know uh and it's it's you know when you get that kind of overreaction then what happens is the group after that you get more victimization and stuff because people are now afraid to prosecute or do this stuff because of this it's just scary it's scary I mean, I think what's crazy about the satanic panic thing, and I'm so excited that there's a larger uh, exploration of this, is that I wonder if something like that is just an era of or a, a moment of its own time where, like, if a news story like that happens later as mass media continues to grow, I wonder if exposure of it reveals it to be as flimsy as it is faster if it was just I, like i think that i think that no matter how well understood the mechanics of it i think the terror moves faster than the facts and and i think yeah, that we had, they had good oh, distribution oh, there's, no, there's no doubt yeah I, I think i think the but the the difference is that like terror lingers if there's no other point of view right uh, uh terror lingers if there's no outside uh, interaction with it and that's something that i think fundamentally if there is a difference between then and now is that we expect the world to react to everything now in a way that didn't happen before things were more provincial i you know it, it's a good question i think one of the one of the challenging things though is that like we still have this mindset if we if the crime is horrific enough we will then decide 
well, then due process, we don't need it. That's the scary thing. We still have that mentality of like, well, this person didn't deserve a trial because of what they've been accused of. And it's like, wait a second. You yeah. know, they've been accused of something horrible. And now we're saying they don't deserve a trial. Like, what if they're innocent? Ah, oh, it's too horrible to even offer them a chance. And it's like that, that weird, not under, and you see this a lot in political discussions all over, whatever, where all of a sudden we want to dispense with due process because, ah, no, this is just too outrageous. Now they, we have to do this. And we saw it with, you know, t- uh, th- th- there's a remarkable story uh, near the, I don't know, two thirds mark about a guy who got scooped up, both his, the guy and his wife. Uh, he, she got bail. He did not. In two and a half years of being in jail awaiting trial, he gets a plea deal where he's offered uh, only 960 years if he admits that he's guilty. And uh, at wow. which point he will be eligible for parole in 2152 or something like that. And he had been so dialed in watching, you know, kind of where the wind was blowing through his lawyer that he said no. And they came back three days later and they're like, okay, 60 years, just admit to this one. And then he said no. And then three mm-hmm. days later they came back and they're like, okay, just admit to this one three years and he's like no and then finally they came back and they're all like all right just admit to lewd behavior with the minor and you could go home tonight for just time served and that was the point where he had to call his wife and she's like you could literally come home tonight and we could put all of this behind us and so the bummer is it's like I, I understand why he would say yeah I'll take the deal he has to be on a, a, a federal you know sex offender registry he did eventually get his kids back and all that stuff but but uh it's 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 a true miscarriage of justice all the way around it's amazing well that and that's one of the things that often we as public doesn't really so much understand what happens is that you know you get accused of a thing right and then all of a sudden the prosecutors go to you and say, all right, you know, uh, Brian, you've been accused of running an illegal koala farm on your property. And you're like, it was my neighbor's koala. It walked over here onto my property. Oh, you admit it. You know, like, you know, 50 years. Oh my gosh, 50 years, Brian, you're going to lose everything. But if you admit to it for you only be five years, you get out, you go back to podcasting. You can never be near a koala again, <laughs> but you can do this. And you're like, but I, but I didn't do this, but I didn't do this. And now you're weighing the thing in your head. Like, well, yeah, if you fight this, then you're going to spend 50 years and you're never going to be able to play with koalas again. Um, and this is they they force that, you know, they put the people in that situation where plea, 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 plea. And people will plea, not because necessarily they think that they're guilty. It's just because the, they, that risk, that chance that if they fight this, then they say the prosecutors say they're going to go for the full thing if they lose to a jury trial. And that's the psycho- the thing we just don't understand so much of what goes into it and why sometimes like 90% of cases end in pleas, you know, like yeah. just never really well, go and, to the and trial also, phase. And also like really weird that- back, backdoor bargains, um, a friend of mine, man, 20 or 30 years ago, bought some uh, technical equipment that he suspected might have been stolen or hot or whatever. So I mean, he was guilty. But then they they picked him up for that and they said, hey. You can go to trial on this and possibly face three, four, or five years or whatever. Uh, you could plead guilty and definitely get two years. Or also, we got this kind of loose hot checks case floating around. If you plead guilty to that, to that too, it'll only be one year and we'll guarantee you minimum security prison. And he's like, wait, so all I have to do is sign this other thing and I get half the sentence? Sure, I did those hot checks. And so I, I, I got to imagine that there's a lot of saving face that that happens with. Yeah, and that's, yeah, you know, there's there's that just a, be illegal a, that, and... that, that that entire process. Yeah. Are we in a time lag here? Maybe. Um, uh, I I I think just a little bit, but I think we're at the with hopefully uh, okay. uh a little bit. Uh, uh, Justin, do you have a pick? Okay. Uh, yeah, my pick is Community. I started watching it. It's a good show. Hot takes, hot takes, man. If we're if we're gonna talk yeah. about hot takes, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean it's really good. Uh, spoiler alert for my my upcoming review of the premiere of the rest of uh, Rick and Morty uh, last night. Uh, I never thought a Rick and Morty episode could be up its own butt and not have it be a visual gag, but but it was last night. Uh, we'll talk about it on uh, Cord Killers. I uh, I just finished rewatching Community. Uh, or did I even finish it? I might not have finished that. No, I did finish it. I don't think anybody That's... did, including the <laughs> staff. Uh, and a lot of community holds up. And then once once you get into the, the couple of seasons where 
you know, oh, Dan Harmon's on the outs, Dan Harmon's coming back, uh, the, the Yahoo stuff. Yeah. You know, the show was kind of pivoted to be, you know, and I, I, I think I, I respect it of trying to be like, we don't want to be the formulaic thing that, uh, you know, got us, that that really honestly worked very well early on. Um, but I I don't know, it, it just... It just has a little bit of a tinge on the on the tail end there, but I think I think a lot of community holds up really well. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Abed and Pierce specifically are just such great, great characters. Like uh, uh, they are written so well, and uh, uh, it, it is it is a fascinating look at uh, how uh, Chevy Chase, <laughs> who is like obviously reviled as as we find out yet again chevy chase finds a new generation of uh uh cohorts to have make uh hate him is kind of played as sort of that character right <laughs> he is this this mm-hmm. like a uh, a toxic old dude that nobody likes and uh, uh and yet he is still very talented and the writing is great uh, it's a show that the further away they got from the Joe McHale's character and the Brita character romance and those, the further away they got from that, the better it was. And uh, and I would say that some of the best episodes were pretty spread out. And I think that the period when Dan Harmon wasn't there, I think you could tell the difference. But there were some good episodes there. you know. And I think when he came back, it wasn't like all of a sudden like, ah, the magic's all back now. you know. But uh, that was a show that really surprised me. It was much better than I thought. Yeah. I said, come watch it. Uh, I got a pick. Uh, this was actually a few weeks ago. Hopefully I didn't mention it on the show already, but uh, I found uh, the Hulu original show uh, Shrill to be uh, to be a very easy watch. Um, I think they've got two seasons out now, and I believe that they're working on a, on a third season. Uh, but I, I, I thought that I think that this was uh, uh, really, really funny, uh, you know, m- more than anything. Um I mean, I think it, it's 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 a you know it's a fine concept, but uh, in execution in in writing, uh, I think Shrill is is a really a really great show. You know, what's about... what's the uh, elevator pitch? So, Aidy Bryant is is the is the lead character. She is a um, she runs the calendar at a weekly uh, n- newspaper in in Oregon, I think, or Portland or something, and uh, she she she's she's kind of a a, a bigger gal. And it's it's kind of a slice of life uh, story about her, uh, you know, navigating the world uh, in a world where you know we we still have like weird. Uh, uh, there's there's baggage about plus size ladies. Yeah, and so you know she you know she does some she ends up doing some writing and ends up uh, uh, having kind of being this sort of firebrand writer uh, for this weekly paper and and some of her um, you know uh, her interactions there and and her her love life trying to figure out. You know, if this uh, friends with benefits relationship with this guy could actually be up, um, and uh, and I I think it's really I think it's really good. Uh, also, just a, a couple of really great um, I think you should leave with Tim Robinson cameos. Uh, the uh, the Santa delivered us a printer girl. Uh, she is a, a recurring character, and uh, the <laughs> the guy from the. Uh, the uh, the the porn guy honking following uh, Ted's oh, character. Yeah, he's uh, he's in season two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, it's great and uh, uh, yeah, uh, shrill on Hulu. I have two picks because I love you all. Uh, my first pick is uh, my friends Jordan Gold and Simon Cornell, along with Max Timken, have put out a new project on Kickstarter, which is called Magic Puzzles. And Simon and Jordan are magicians who also love puzzles. And so what they decided to do was to come up with jigsaw puzzles that once you put them together, a little bit of magic happens. And that's as much as I can say. Um, and so they've started this cool project. So if you go to Kickstarter and you look up Magic Puzzles, you can see this. They started it launched today. They're already you know, blew past their, you know, the funding goal, but uh, just a really, really cool idea, you know, really neat artwork that, you know, neat designs, something fun to do. And then the idea that once you finish it, there's a little bit, something else happens. And they talk so a lot, magic. They, they talk a lot in, in the, the Kickstarter, uh, uh, like description of the ways that they try to make it a very 
quote unquote premium jigsaw, right? Like in terms of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the cutting accuracy or, you know, things like uh, puzzle dust, which I didn't know was a thing or hand or like custom doing all of the pieces so that each piece doesn't really cut off too much of the visual imagery, you know, that each piece kind of has its own um, specific look. I think this looks really, really cool. As opposed to just random cut. Yeah, or cutting into the middle of, uh, into the middle of, uh, you know, contours and stuff. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they put a lot of effort to it, and that, of course, is, you know, uh, Max Timken, uh, who is, you know, got a pretty good track record there. So I think uh, it just, again, I'm very proud of my friends been working on this for a long time, watching them work on it, watching them finally get this thing released. And it's cheap. You can buy one puzzle for 20 bucks. You can get all three for 60 and, you know, if you want something kind of beautiful, fun, and cool that spend your time doing it and it'll be rewarded at the end, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And I, I just love the artwork and the way it looks. So uh, uh, that is Magic Puzzles on Kickstarter. Now, my other pick, my media pick, also on Hulu. Uh, I am loving, I finished, I love Devs. I absolutely love Devs, which was the Alex Garland eight-part series. Alex Garland, previously, he did the movie Ex Machina, wrote and directed it, and then he did Annihilation, which wasn't my favorite Alex Garland thing, but as a writer, he's been around for a long time. He wrote the screenplay for the Dread movie, the cool one, Carl Urban, a lot of other really cool stuff. Uh, this one stars uh, Sonoya Mizuno, Nick Offerman, um, Allison Pill, Jin Ha, uh a i would say that the delivery the characters do use is kind of very david mamet-esque the premise is i'm going to say that is a it's really a philosophical mystery set inside of a techno thriller and at the beginning it kind of feels like well i know who my techno villain is and i kind of got, know where this is going to go and i'm like ah, it's going to go way deeper it's going to go way deeper so that's devs d-e-v-s on hulu man that's so I wild uh, i'm really glad to hear that because i've heard a couple of other recommendations to go see it but i know that our own bryce castillo uh ended up kind of giving up at the end it didn't land with you no the opposite the, the, no the opposite. no he <laughs> hated it he said it consistently <laughs> devs sucks no. i'm bryce castillo <laughs> dev is devs is bad it's garbage <laughs> bad I hate it. That's a that's a stated fact. What Everyone I, knows this. What I said is F devs. <laughs> there's Price a, Castillo. There's a lot of bad stuff in devs, but the ending saves it. I think Period. <laughs> End of sentence. <laughs> I think the the beginning I would, the beginning is a little tough to get through and I think the middle is maybe a little watery, but I think the ending and what they end up trying to get to uh is good. I think there are good ideas there. I would, I would say that like AKA yeah, I would say Bryce. that like yeah I would say that with Alex Garland that and and I and I and I, I I hear what you're saying and I think that I would say he made choices and I would say those choices were very deliberate where in other shows I would say those were not so much choices as just as much oh, I don't know whatever you know oh yeah and we're here there's choices that sometimes I go, ah, you know, I don't, that's an artistic thing. I don't know if that's for me, like the delivery and some of the ways it works, but I'm like, I, I mentioned like, like to me, it's kind of like a very David Mamet-esque way in the way some of these things work, where it's deliberate. This is the way he's going to do it. And on the surface, it looks like every other crappy techno thriller with a techno villain. If you just watch the trailer, it looks artistic and stuff. You'd be inclined to think like, oh, I get it. There's a big mystery. Wonder who did it, da, 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 da. And it's like, nope. The bigger thing going on there and a, a philosophical thing. And so I, I really, really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, I had somebody on Twitter's like, well, I didn't agree with this. I'm like, I don't agree with that, but I love the way it was presented. You know, I love, I love Garland kind of, and I also like, I think, you know, that the problem was like, I don't think you understood what he actually said, <laughs> not to say, aha, but it was like, it's he, Alex Garland, like an ex Mac and he wanted to get into the idea of artificial intelligence and go very, very deep on that. And I loved, you've all seen Ex Machina? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And and it was like, I, I just like, and there's a couple things in there. I'm like, well, that's sort of, you didn't need, it was sort of silly, but it was beautifully done and a wonderful, like, you know, so much better than stuff. Like, I haven't seen where Westworld's gone. And I think Westworld is a pretty show. I think Westworld has a really kind of neat approach towards stuff. But I think Westworld to me doesn't go, it looks, it, it pretends to go deep, but it doesn't really go deep. You know, and it, and it sort of feels more like lost to me than, 
you know, an, a, an artist, you know, writer, director saying, no, I'm going to explore this. I'm going to show you what I think about this. And we, you can disagree with me, but let me just take it as far as I can. So, yeah, I would, uh, I would agree with that yeah. comparison for Westworld. I mean, we've been talking about it on spoiler in time, but uh, I think it was last week I said like, Hey, it's Westworld's very dumb this, this season. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of dumb. Very pretty, very, <laughs> very pretty. Like, very... I can't, uh, we were talking about how somehow uh, the sum is less than all the parts. Yes. Like every single part of Westworld is exquisite and yet all put together. I care about it less than ever. <laughs> it's only during the, after the episode, like behind the scenes things where they're talking like this episode, we want to question like humanity and is our, are humans actually ro- are, are robots, humans <laughs> more robots than like humans. A, oh yeah, I guess so. I guess you kind of did that. That's yeah. A, yeah, okay. You should have said that. You should have said that. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't seen season three. And again, I. I. It's beautiful. I like everybody in, and I like everybody involved. That's why it says like I like. I'm a fan of everybody involved in this show. In the show, you know, Jonathan Nolan, you know, Lisa, all I like every everybody's great. And I don't know what happens when you're when you're talking to HBO and in the executives and what we want. So, I'm not blaming anybody. I will tell you the moment that really. One season one, the thing frustrated me, spoiler alert, was like, ah, they're the same guy, even though one's one foot taller than the other and all that. Dun, dun, dun. I'm like, okay, that's a long way to go for a narrative trick that doesn't really help the story to me, but that's fine. I know you got to do this. And then it was like season two, like, ah, yeah, we're recording everybody in their hats. We use the hats. And I'm like, oh my God, yeah. that's like a Matrix battery thing. I'm like, this this. Funny was you should mention really the Matrix. Funny. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the hat well, stuff doesn't we, go away. Yeah. Hey, guess it, what? It, they it, love that hat. Man, if, you, if you love the, the Matrixiness hat. and the, the hat trickery, then boy, are you going to love season three of Westworld. <laughs> season three is the hat trick. Well, I mean, they, I haven't seen anything, but I, I, they, 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 they kind of season two was about building a Matrix. So it's kind of like, well, I think I know where we're going to go here. So yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just making an assumptions there. I have no idea. But anyhow, did they ever uh, go back Debs, to Westworld? Are there horses in the show anymore? Or they do no it once. They, they do. They do once in season three. Yeah, but they do go to like, oh my gosh, we're in such beautiful country. Uh, other person, yeah, this is the place that Westworld was based on, <laughs> but we're not in Westworld. It just looks exactly like the ranch where we shot. We're Westworld. just we're just riding these horses through Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> Gotcha. So there are horses. Yes. Because it didn't look like there was a lot of horses in the commercials. So I haven't watched it yet. Because I'm mostly here for the horses. I'll tell you what, man. It's probably a worthy watch while you're playing Hearthstone. I mean, it's just everything is it's beautiful. <laughs> Set design. Everyone's good. You actor. need to really, Brian. You need to definitely start qualifying all of your reviews as to whether or not you're watching them with your undivided attention, or whether or not it's a Hearthstone watch. It, it doesn't have does. to be like yeah, a negative point. thing. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, but I, just as a qualifier. I, I, I think that's become a standard habit. And and Westworld uh, to qualify, I have given my full attention to for good or for okay. ill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I yeah. I've been in, and I'll talk about it next. I'll talk about Picard, which I'm almost done. But I've been enjoying it. But occasionally the phone comes out, you know, I'm like, oh, these characters are talking. Phone comes out, da, 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 you know, um, but that surprised me. I've enjoyed that way more than I thought. I'll talk next week. So cool. It's been weird. Coolio. Hey, good episode, everybody. Um, uh, before we get into after things, uh, Andrew, I might have you. Just disconnect and reconnect to the Opal for me and see if that, because uh, we were definitely getting Opa. Opa, because uh, we were getting a little bit of the, the delay stuff there, and thankfully we we're close enough to the end where it didn't seem to be too much of an issue. So hopefully, uh, am I back? He sounds like he's back. I can hear him. All right, one cool. second. I'm gonna go turn. It. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and if anybody needs to go get a drink now, it'd be a good time to do it yeah, right. before we go do after yeah. things. I'm gonna take a break from monitors in my ears. Oh That's yeah. Harder than I expected. What's up, Justin? How you doing? Oh, you know, uh, just uh, following all of our crazy world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've been having a lot. I've been trying to figure out something to do with the politics Patreon because, like, Cause it's probably yeah, it was pretty really, one note right now, right? Yeah, it was really built around, you know, me going around and covering an election <laughs> that I guess is nominally <laughs> still happening, but there's certainly no more value add to the traveling part right Mm -hmm. maybe at some like the second there is an all clear on on this i'm going somewhere Uh, there may not be people there but i will be going to a place and doing a thing wow but 
um, until then, I'm I'm just kind of like trying to wrap my head around like, all right, what's a thing that I can do that just makes it mm-hmm. better? <laughs> like, I I just kind of feel like the audience has been waiting. the The audience's birthday is once every four years, and and now I just like all these like you know teenage girls that have their birthday parties during the pandemic and so all their friends like drive by and honk the horn and wave at them like yeah. it's not perfect but it's something it demonstrates effort and i kind of feel like i i i spent the 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 weekend just trying to think about like exactly what what that's going to be have you considered doing more like historical mini just like like hey like well, that's part of it. Yeah. So I was like, all right, what if I just tie raise the dead into it and I just do kind of some mini stuff. Uh, so like I, I, in my mind, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to kind of like keep raise the dead as like a, no, I, I work really hard on this and I make sure that it's perfect. And then I release it because it's different than the other stuff I do, which is even as I've put more production effort into it, it's basically live to tape. Um, but something that's like and maybe a book report or, you know, a like freaking show and tell or something like like I think there's a way you can lower the stakes on that and you can still fill in. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, we'll see. I mean, I've can started you dive into the politics of Billy Crystal. I'll tell you what, I watched Forget Paris yesterday. Do you does is the Justin Robert Young review see it or forget it? Uh, dude, that movie is like good. It's like legit good, and it was uh uh shocking because like critically it was it's like a fifty percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and and the audience score isn't all that much different. Although I don't know what kind of lunatic is going back onto Rotten Tomatoes and uh reviewing for God Par- forget Paris. Though so IMDb's uh, also got it at six point five. Yeah, which is it, all right. It's it's a really smart, uh, a, a really smart uh, romantic comedy, and I think part of the difference is that, like, if it were released now, I feel like it would be looked at far differently because, especially at the time, the idea of that kind of comedy was usually done telling stories for people in their like teens 20s and like maybe early 30s but like you pretty much got the cut off unless it was like about people whose lives are just disasters and they have to get their thing together because they have stunted growth or something like that Mm -hmm. uh the the like meat cutes and and that kind of stuff was was really just a uh not for those stories and this is a story very much a story about people in their 40s but in terms of the narratives, it's a split narrative that's basically told as friends are waiting for other friends to show up at a dinner party. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, uh, they're like telling the story of this couple as they're waiting for everybody to show up. And it's like, it's a really clever way to, to stagger that narrative, to do a, a dual time narrative and your character the character that you're following is like the new fiance who's like kind of joining the group so it's like a bunch of couples and Mm. and one of them was always single and now he's marrying somebody and so like she's hearing all this story for the first time as they're waiting and and that you are her as the audience as you find all this stuff out uh but it's well done and it was uh billy crystal directed it he did Mr. Saturday Night, which is bad and is a really uh, it's an example of dual timeline stuff in a very bad way, told very, you know, not good. Mm -hmm. And then this is a split timeline thing that actually like is constantly tied together. But uh, it's good. Forget Paris. Spoiler alert. There you go. Don't forget it. Oh, yeah. And also um, uh, uh, it it walked so Space Jam could run in terms of NBA players acting. Oh, really? Who's in it? A ton of NBA cameras because he's a ref. So they shoot a bunch of stuff and they have like pretty much all the stars of like early 90s NBA. Oh, Charles Barkley. Uh, yeah, play. Uh, uh, Charles Barkley can yeah. hold his own. I mean, playing himself. 
And Barkley doesn't even really do a lot. If anything, the, the real standout is David Robinson, who is uh, was never known to be a oh, big he was personality always, guy. Yeah, he was always like uh, just just the blank page. Like he's exactly. Like, Do you but need he's me to great. stand in front of a copier? I'm I'm an MVP. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, and that's the thing is, and he is so much more. He jumps off the screen more than Barkley does. No kidding. Yeah. Hey, look at that. We just talked uh, casually about basketball. That's amazing. Look at that. No oh, cream. Uh, Did you know the guy that invented Air Jordans played basketball? <laughs> <laughs> Russ Limbaugh. Yeah, it's jo well. Jordan Gold. We know. He's really clever. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Rush Limbaugh has a cameo. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Oh. Uh, all right, Justin, did you need to go take a break? Uh, no, I'm good. Okay. Uh, did, uh, did, did you have a particular topic that you wanted to talk about? Well, I did have a big one, Brian, but I'll push it aside for whatever you want to talk about. Well, I, I don't know just that this... it up. It's gone. It's gone. Go ahead. You're talking. I, 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 I just had an anomaly in our email output, and, and I don't know if it's an idea that I had paying off or just an anomaly or possibly even just a reporting glitch. Uh, so I was going to report some real numbers that might be kind of fun and, and um, uh, uh, voyeuristic for people. Sure, you know what we could do we could do a product a a, a project check in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because because we've all got stuff out there. Yeah. Just just a know. sort of a state state of our state of our independent creator uh, collective. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Uh, give me another minute. I'll pull up some of my stuff here. Oh yeah, Bryce, you can be part of it too. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Uh, uh, Bryce is on the email. Oh, that's the first one I think about because Bryce. Every time an email goes out, Bryce knows he's going to get notes. Oh yeah, I'll be like, oh, and they're great. <laughs> I love, I love, I love using okay. these. Being that God, it is I, so. I, I derive that same sense of joy from somebody being early enough in the process that you know that you're actually being listened to when you reach out to them directly. I think Meryl Barr is, oh, he is, he's in the chat right now. I, I get that sense with Meryl Barr where he's one of the few people that will actually listen when I talk. And so as a result, it's really fun to talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, cool. Well, you guys wanna get started then? Yeah. Yep. All right, then I'll count you in, in three, two, Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Ugh. Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Hey. <laughs> uh, we're going to do a little check-in around the, uh, the circle here about the different projects that we've been involved with. Uh, Justin has been doing uh, the Raise the Dead, and he's got a new Billy Crystal podcast because he's literally <laughs> going out of his mind. Um, Bryce has got his video game newsletter, which he's been doing, and mm -hmm. Brian, of course, has many, many different enterprises around the world. And so um, we're going to uh, – let's start with Brian. Yeah, so I ran into a weird anomaly. Uh, so we talked before about how uh, the it's so important to have a mailing list, and you want to train your audience to open stuff up. Um, during once we hit the pandemic, uh, a, a big part of the brand of everything we do on Scam Stuff is is leading people towards that moment of being the most interesting person in the room, whether it's at the party, a get together, a family reunion at the bar, uh, whether it's because you want to meet a significant other or date or just, you know, introduce yourself. Um, obviously, in a world where all of that gets put on pause, it complicates a lot of a lot of, hey man, buy this trick and have everyone be amazed by you. And so we pivoted and the last three or four emails was um, the, the operating theory was, okay, during this time, I, I assume nobody's going to want to, you know, give us money so that they could go out and be the most interesting person in the room. But what we can do is train people to uh, associate a new email from us with there's something in here that's worth doing. So we started doing giveaways. We have a bunch of tutorials anywhere from like uh, two bucks to five bucks. And w once a week, we've sort of just been saying like, hey man, normally this costs money, but you can have it for free. Uh, use this downtime to learn a new trick. And uh, the first one we did was about a month ago. And then we did a follow, and that one got, um, let me double check here. Uh, Okay, so the first freebie, we got uh, a good open rate on. So, so that's that's the whole thing is we're trying to get to a better uh, rate of people opening our stuff. Um, the last thing we sold 
got an 8.5% open rate, and this is to uh, about 100,000 people. And then the first giveaway that we did that basically had the message, hey, let's take advantage of this downtime to learn something. Uh, here is a collection of how to palm cards. Normally it costs money, you get it for free. That got a 17.2 open rate, which is very good on a statistically significant 100,000 email list, mm -hmm. um, 3.2 clicks. And then um, the first time we tried to sell something, it was like a soft sell. It was like basically, hey, uh, if you're like us using this time to learn more stuff, here are three self-working magic trick books on cards, mentalism, and coins that we like a lot. As a matter of fact, you'll recognize there's there's 250 tricks in here total. You'll recognize a lot of these eventually showed up on Scam School and Scam Nation. Uh, because we're able to wholesale them, we can get a discount. We're not going to make much money on this, but if you would like all three books, we'll go ahead and bundle them together for you. So, so that wasn't so much as a sales thing, so much as trying to position ourselves as a public service. 12% um, open. Uh, but then... The last one we did, what do you think, and, and, and it's just a straight up, it's a 23-minute tutorial on the three-coin trick. Uh, 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 Andrew, you know it as a two in the hand, one in the pocket, classic of magic, right? We have a 23-minute tutorial on it that normally is $2.50, and uh, the title I used was another uh, free giveaway. Is that what it was? Another, another free gift. Another free gift. Yeah. What do you think the open rate on that is? Mm. Uh, 15 22 percent. 22 I don't know if this is a glitch but MailChimp number weighing <laughs> <laughs> uh, MailChimp is showing a 46.2 percent open rate wow. on this which is astonishing uh, for, 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 for the full email list I've never seen anything like it and I don't know if it is a case of could be a glitch could be because I don't think it's just the word free because I ignore a lot of stuff that says the word free. Uh, what I suspect is, is that uh, this is the fourth kind of email in a row where we're not really asking for much. We're just sort of trying to provide value. And I think that uh, maybe, say, you know, your Gmails or your Yahoo's or whatever, like enough people are opening it that it kicks it out of the prom or out of the spam bin, out of the promotions bin and into the hey, you probably want to look at this bin and uh, uh, because it's got like 4.3% clicks. So that's like 5,000 clicks off of it. Um, what what do you guys think is going on there? Because it's, it's a really short email. Mm -hmm. All it says is, um, you know, hey, here's a here's a free thing that normally costs money. I would be surprised if the, so, like, I think the interesting thing about the subject line, just another free gift. And I don't know if you A-B tested this or if there's another one out there. Uh, yeah, we just went straight uh, with that. I think it, it gets directly to the point, which is I have something for you, but it doesn't get into the minutia of I'm giving you a new tutorial. This is just Brian well, is giving you something. Yeah, I think it, it's a step further. It's that you have been missing out on the free things mm. that you that I have been giving. So you think like, the important it, word is another and not free? I think if, if we're going to parse it, right, I, I, I think that that is an intriguing word, right? It is a pattern that it's like now I'm going to start watching a television show on episode four because my friends say that it's good. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, regardless, I mean, we're, we're not making money on it, but, but, uh, I, I am really, really pleased that, uh, you know, we talk about, uh, training the algorithm, training the people to associate, you know, your name, your value, your brand with, with being something worthy of their attention. Um, it seems to be paying dividends in, in a time that, that you wouldn't think that there's not, not a lot that you can get done. So I know that these giveaway emails don't have, you know, they're not really say, you know, trying to get turn people over necessarily into sales right now. Are there any other metrics that you're you are comparing the list against? Like, are, yeah, are so there like are you seeing a like a reduced rate of unsubscriptions or? I don't know. Uh, let me see. On unsubscribes, we only had three hundred unsubscribes, so th that is something that um, mm. uh, if half of the entire list opened something, no matter what the thing was, it could be you know a. a, a a, a gold turd uh, i assume some people would be like yeah but it looks like a turd and then unsubscribe you know <laughs> um 
so so we only saw 300 unsubscribes uh one of the things that i'm looking at is the traffic seems to be real because like right now there are 22 people on the store yesterday uh, today we've had 2400 visitors to the store to get the free thing yesterday we had nearly 5000 visitors to the store so it's like uh sales weren't crazy but but it's like Every single one of those is somebody who possibly has never bought something from us before, who's mm -hmm. now practicing, uh, because you go through the full process. You have to give your name and your address and all that stuff. Then you apply the discount code that takes it down to zero dollars. So it's it's almost as though you rehearse what it's like to be a customer so that down oh. the road, when we have something worth value, that that it won't feel weird for you to go to a store called Scam Stuff and, and give us money. Yeah. So it sounds like you guys yeah, think that that, makes it, that might be a real number then. Might be. I mean, I I repeat, follow, you know, but uh, I certainly think that I know I opened one of them because part of it was like another free gift. I'm like, well, I missed the first one. And they're like, oh, cool. This is yeah. cool. Neat magic trick. Um, So, yeah, e even I think there's that, but make it. No, go ahead. Oh, it's just the delay. I don't know when to jump in. Uh, yeah, no, fi you fi finish your thought then. Okay, yeah, I say that like I think what you're doing is great, and that if you know people know every time they open up an email, it's not just buy this. And you've never been like that, but like buy this, buy this. Would it be used there, to like? There oh, have cool, been stretches where I think I've over harvested. Uh, that's that's one of the when we wrote our mission statement, I I made sure to put the word uh, sustainably harvest attention and convert it into sales because it is possible to if you're just the guy who's always asking for money or always saying like ah we're so screwed or whatever, um, then at that at some point you stop even opening those emails uh so so this is an opportunity to to water that garden and continue to have a reputation of being worthy of being opened mm -hmm. yeah and i think this is a great time for that you know uh, all the all the things that have kind of gone out of paywall like uh, if if this is not the time for money this is certainly the time where i think a lot of folks who are selling things are like well right now we can just give you more stuff and hopefully by the time that you come back and you have money you want more of it true bryce uh yeah what's going on so yeah i've been doing the the video games with bryce email newsletter every week once i think once a week is kind of really what i've settled into in terms of mm -hmm. um you know, spending spending the right amount of time on it and having the right amount of content, especially as things have kind of dried up a little bit um, on on the gaming side, whether it's news or or releases. Uh, but I I have had a pretty good uh, uh, pr pretty good uh, open rates um, for uh, for for the past few months. I think once once I got that uh, that feedback from you, Andrew, about um, kind of honing in on subject lines, I've been at a pretty solid on initial sends. Uh, you know, 66%, 51%, 65, 62. And I granted, this is about a hundred people or so who are reading. So it's, it's not by any means, large numbers or, or scientific, but, um, I, you know, I'm, I, I've been getting a lot of good feedback when I ask questions. Uh, I think we talked last time or, or, or a week before about like putting closer up to the, to the, near the top of the email, like, Hey, if I'm looking for responses, put it up there, put it up front and ask for it very directly. Uh, and and that worked out really well. I got a bunch that I included on uh, on last week's email. So um, so that's been, been 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 pretty good. I feel I feel pretty solid about it. And then in terms of uh, kind of finding something to use that list for, I've been trying to time it so it's either Thursday or uh, during the day on Friday, so that I can uh, uh, kind of um, get get people over to watch the the streams that I do on on Friday and sometimes on Saturday. Like we did. Uh, marbles on Saturday during the middle of the day and we had a ton of people play and watch and uh, that was a really good time so uh, yeah I, I feel like I, I've been I've been pretty solid on that and and um, uh, you know just trying to uh, trying trying to find you know news stories you know I think I think in terms of like you know we talked earlier on weird things about about science reporting and how you still have the kind of crazy content demands of like you need to do a million posts and uh you know that means that they're not always great um i think blogs are having that same issue and a lot of the places where i source news from are having some of that issue 
where they're doing like a lot of entertainment reporting and, and that's not something I want, I would like to do. I'd rather just not do it. Um, and so just, just finding content and trying to find evergreen topics or, or things to, to get people talking about the thing that I got feedback on last week was like, Hey, I just refunded this game and now I have a bunch of credit on steam. If you had this $14 or $13, what would you spend it on? And I got a lot of good inf- good recommendations, and I even made a purchasing decision. Which, by the way, this is a very good subject line. It just says, you got me to spend $13, and it has a gold emoji. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, and then it was, you know, a lot of just feedback with uh, people, a little back and forth, and then I uh, got a plug-in for the stream. Oh, that button doesn't work. Uh-oh. That's, that should have checked that. Um, and then a little bit of news and writing stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I've been feeling uh, uh, feeling pretty good about it. Nice. I think you're doing a great job. And, and I think that, uh, you know, some of the best email lists, like, are things just you, you build up over years, you know, and, you know, often, you know, when we give advice to people, you know, we've seen how people want that immediate gratification. But, you know, Bryce, you know, about building things and doing things over time. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I'm lucky, like, I've got a very, for an author, I have a wonderfully large email list that I started building 20 years ago, but not really ever aggressively building, but over time, it's gotten to be pretty substantial. And I think that for you, you know, putting yourself out there as a video game personality and person, I think you're doing, you know, you're doing wonderfully well in between this and the live streams. Thank you. Um, You know, one of the, one of the, I think when I, when I first started talking about this on this program, you know, I, I mentioned wanting to do stuff that you would normally just make a blog for, and it would just be a medium blog or something. And um, one of the things I've, I've, I've had is I've started doing, which um, I, I don't know how much it's applicable to other types of email lists, but um, if when I write something or when I share it on Twitter, you know, I can share a permalink for it, but there's not like an like a sign up thing. Like I've had people email to the, reply to that tweet and go, I don't know. I mean, this is cool. I don't know how to sign up for it. So I've actually had to start putting in like a sign up for this email list that you're ostensibly yeah. on in the middle of the well list. yeah but that's yeah it's uh, it's all about the forward stuff i yeah. would bet that that belongs at the very top uh and and that's really? not from any knowledge i have but i know that axios uh the very first thing somehow in fact it's not even my email um i guess i was logged in on like the monorogue or the scam nation email or something mm-hmm. when somebody signed up for the axios daily whatever but the very first thing it says is uh, did you get this because it was forwarded to you sign up for it right here oh okay interesting yeah yeah, that's what I on the free political newsletter. I got the same thing. It's it's up top with like other stuff because push comes to shove. If people are blind to it, then that's fine. But if they got it and they notice it and they want to sign up, like it's better to have that up top. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I I, I hadn't considered that. I, part of my thought was like, okay, well they read, you know, and it's not at the bottom of the email, right? Like in this one, it's above the news article, so it's it's uh, it's a little it's a little bit of, it's it's the third I guess middle break. Um, and so I guess my, my thinking and putting it lower was like, well, people are asking me about this. It's because they've read it and they they didn't see it. Um, but, you know, that that's, you know, how, however many people did tell me, how, how many people didn't. Yeah, I would imagine that the thinking is if you got it forwarded to you and that's the first thing you read, it says, was this forwarded to you? You think, yes. It's like, well, if you want to sign up, click here. It's like, we'll see. Then you read the article. And then you're like, oh yeah, no, 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 I do want more of this. And then you go back and you click the thing. Yeah. So uh, that's that's my update. Uh, things are looking good. Nice. J- Justin, uh, tell us what stage that you are at in your either your therapy <laughs> or your clinical diagnosis. Uh, forget Paris. That's uh, that's the answer. No, I mean. Uh, uh, I've actually had a good time with uh, doing the crystal thing. It's um, I, I've, I've tried to kind of uh, because it is sort of a project for me more than it is something that I really like uh, am working on. It's it's kind of more of a retreat of trying to hone certain skills and see how fast I can turn stuff around, how happy I feel about it. Like it's it's kind of a project with without limits. Um, you know, uh, uh, it, it's been. It's been good so far. It's uh, uh, I can kind of add things and sort of evolve it. Uh, I mean, I think like eleven people are listening, which is probably uh, twelve people too many. But uh, <laughs> it, it's it's uh, it, it's been fun. It's been a it's been a good uh, way to stretch my creative legs a little bit. 
Hmm. But I think, you know, that's certainly, I think we've talked about here, if you really want to create, you really want to do something, you're going to do it even if nobody's paying attention. And, you know, I get, I get that, you know, I want to write a book, but I want to have an agent first. I want to do this. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't sound to me like somebody who wants to write, you know, that doesn't sound to me like that. And, and we talked about a lot about like, you make a thing, even nobody's paying attention. And here you've, you've got this creative energy and, and man, in, in my own self-diagnosis of like, when I go nutty is when I don't have a project. And when I get depressed is when I don't have a project. If I'm yeah. working on a thing, not depressed. Well, yeah, there's something that you can, you can alleviate, right? You can release some of the pressure by just like making a thing. And then all of your anxiety goes into the creative process. Uh, and that's, what's been fun about this is just being able to kind of like come up with something and really make it, uh, uh, you know, my own, uh, my own thing that I'm, that I'm happy with. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll be what it is really. The only thing that I almost, um, <laughs> I almost kind of regret is, is drenching it so much in the, like, I'm going crazy. And that's why I'm making a Billy Crystal podcast because like, I, I almost wish that I would have named it something that wasn't a bit like it wasn't Billy Crystal related. And then that would just be a funny thing that would happen every episode is that I, I happen to keep reviewing Billy Crystal movies. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but beyond that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. And, and also it has, uh, kind of been a good, I mean, really the, the, the stealth th reason why I'm doing it is just because I want to keep iterating in some of the skills that I built with raise the dead before I really want to make another raise the dead. Mm. Do you do you feel too locked in to Billy Crystal, or is that just a bit that you would have liked? To I, I I would imagine that, and, and forgive me for jumping in because I want to lock my prediction in before the the reveal. But I would imagine that it's freeing that it's something that you don't have to care too much about. It's not so precious that you're worried about screwing it up. It's just like it's like working out with weights. I don't have a strong emotion connection to weights they're just the things that are hard to move that i go to the gym to do so yeah, yeah yeah i mean that's part of it part of it is just being able to to do a thing where i can just kind of take it wherever i want and i can refine it and i can keep making it its own thing and it's just helpful to do a thing to launch the boat and then let it find its own voice and it's low stakes enough because if people are like Hey, I hate the Billy Crystal podcast. I'd be like, cool, yeah, no, that's a that's a valid opinion. <laughs> uh, what about you? What do you got, Andrew? Nutty. Yeah, you just had a big uh, book well, big book come out. What's up next? Yeah. yeah. So the official book release day was uh, uh, three days ago. For it was the first, so that was when the book officially launches. They had a pre-launch, which was the was a Kindle selection of the month, our Amazon Prime Reads selection, which was awesome. The book spent two weeks at like the number one spot and then like most of the month, like at number two, because you know kids decided to read The Bad Seed. That's fine, encourage your children to read. It's great, that's great guys, just do that. <laughs> uh, and it's the reaction has been fantastic. Uh, the book also has been on Amazon's charts, which is their own version of their like bestseller list. So besides being number one in Kindle, it's been there. And it's just uh, been a wonderful, wonderful launch for the book. I'm excited. People have been really, really enjoying it. And, you know, I continue to push. You know, now is actually the month where I actually even increase my promotion for it. I'm in the middle of writing another book. So it's been, it, you know, always end up having to finish a book right as I'm supposed to be promoting a book, which is probably just poor timing on my part. But mm -hmm. I... I don't know what to say. I've been, you know, everything that I was hoping would happen with it happened. You know, everything that I figured I need to go do to go do, I would do. And working with a wonderful team has been awesome. I, I got a question because yeah. I, I just noticed this on uh, on the listing. Uh, it, it, it seems like you can already pre-order the sequel. Is that a mm -hmm. is is that a, do you do you have any insights on that? I mean, I guess it makes sense, especially in a world where you gave away the first book for free to a lot of people. Is that yes? So. One of the things that I love working with Amazon Publishing is they know a lot about publishing ebooks and digital and publishing. They they they're 
They're a company that started, obviously, when Amazon started publishing several years ago, their own books, their own titles and doing that. It was because they said, you know, we've got a lot of knowledge on how the publishing industry works. The publishing industry by itself is very slow to change. And I've had great experiences with some publishers, but I'm a person that, you know, I started writing eight years ago so or nine years ago. So for me, I came up with a time when ebooks were a way that people read, that everybody bought their books via Amazon or BN.com or whatever. So for me, it's great to work with, you know, another organization that sort of came from that mindset. And one of the things that they do is they look like, okay, how do people buy books? What happens when somebody reads an ebook? Reading an ebook is different than a print book. You get to the end of a print book, you're like, cool, that's great. You set it down. You get to the end of an ebook, you have an electronic device there and it can say, hey, do you want the next book from this person? And you can click to buy. And so with me doing series, it's been a great fit. So if somebody gets to the end of this book, there's the option. Do you want to get the sequel that comes out next year? And that's been phenomenal. That's how I launched the Naturalist series. You know, we did the Naturalist and then we had right after you got to the end of that, Looking Glass, you could pre-order that. And so it's been a, a wonderful way to continue selling books, you know, and it doesn't even have to work with a series. If I was like Stephen King or something, they could put like the next title there. So uh, it's just very smart strategy. You know, we did that early on with our own self-published books. So. Uh, Andrew, did, did Amazon do a book trailer for naturalist? I think they did. I think they did do a book trailer for naturalist and it's always sort of like, I don't realize what they've done until all of a sudden on my Twitter feed, I notice like, cause now they have a pretty cool one for, because uh, no, this one's awesome. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was so pumped to, to retweet this because this was like, this was like TV like good this yeah is, like if this were like a, a television show you know there's like like a few like a, a the only reason why you know it's not a television show is that they don't show a a, a face a pretty face yeah right <laughs> you know it is it is one pretty face close up away from being a show that i would see on usa uh and uh it looked so dope you know, you say that though, but I've had people on Twitter going, I can't wait to watch this. <laughs> like, well, oh, I know. Yeah. I mean, no, no, that's, that's my point. My point is like, like it looks television worthy. Like it is, it is awesome. Uh, 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 I was, I was so pumped to yeah. see it. Yeah. I've been, you know, book trailers. I think if you have the resources and capability to do it, uh are great you know i i once pulled justin into a book trailer project for a sequel to the the chronological man yep and it was a man did we spend a lot of effort on that uh it was uh, very ambitious it was very yeah. like it was like a uh, motion capture and like there was a lot going on <laughs> was, was this the, uh, the martian and... thing yeah yeah the martian and, emperor and i'll yeah, and it was fun though, because like I look back and I think I just wanted an excuse to go make something, you know. But it was, but it was fun to sort of I go back, I look at that, and I'm like, man, I spent a lot of time on this. So, uh, anyhow, uh, I, I think uh, it is, it is. I'm in a very, very. Oh, here we go. We're watching the trailer right now. Yeah. Uh, where the, the caption shows the moon's being eclipsed by some flying saucer thing. Shadows are moving across and it's embarrassing how much time I spent Photoshopping certain elements and creating like two and a half D object. There's Justin. Oh, Houdini. Yeah. Little uh, Houdini. Uh, yeah. Uh, Roosevelt. So. Was that a toy shotgun? <laughs> it was a toy yeah, shotgun. <laughs> yeah. It was my amazing. Yes, Justin Robert Young being killed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's Murdered. great. <laughs> Oh, and yeah, Andrew, I, I didn't want to. I didn't, you know, I do everything by myself, so I, it's either Justin or me. Yeah, it's gonna play what, every man. character. This is cool. Like, like, think back to the early days of of e publishing, self publishing. Um, this was this was fairly top of the line. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I I I look at this. I'm like, man, I should have just made like a Sky Captain, you know, sort of movie ha! instead. Uh, it just gone with that sort of graphic novel look. That was fun. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it like, ah, a lot of stuff I got was garbage. But I'm like, ah, oh, you know, it looks silly, but I'm like, I'm proud of it. I mean, it looks, it looks uh, highly stylistic. It looks like it was, it yeah. was going for a certain thing and that thing has aged just fine. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I was looking for like my, my Sin City sort of 300 sort of graphic yeah. novel look to it. Cause I knew I could do that. I knew I could pull that up. I knew if I said, oh, don't try to make it realistic, try to make it look comic book, you'll be fine. 
um because it just fit the genre uh so eh, you know that's fun but now now i just i just wake up and i look on twitter and i'm like wow there's a book trailer cool yeah that's neat. <laughs> yeah good job well, guys. and also it's like you know uh, uh that was all original art and original photoshopping like the one thing that is that is kind of uh, uh op today is you have so many of these super high quality stock video libraries that you can put stuff together and make it look good like uh uh, uh since this is after things we'll give a little pro tip but uh bryce was talking earlier about art list which is a uh, music uh library for royalty for your music and you just pay it's like once a year or, or might even just be like once for like us full it's, stop it's 200 dollars a year and it's yeah. unlimited music in unlimited videos i think the only thing they have like stipulations on is they don't want you using it in podcasts because that gets very close to just republishing it yeah they say like you have to have voiceover and you really shouldn't use the whole song so it, it's made for videos but it's it's yeah it's very cool because other than that it's very wide open it lets us use i'll anything. tell you what well i definitely used it all throughout raise the dead but it was it was certainly well, not but, but, but you uh, were talking about yeah. it it wasn't like you were saying like welcome to cool music with justin here's a exactly. full song yeah. listen right. yeah <laughs> and you had you were talking over it and you were there were small yeah, bumps yeah, yeah. And yeah stuff. there was a lot of stuff but uh they now have a uh a video service and part of their appeal is that they're not just clips. They are all cut out into clips, but they're basically like full scenes that you can take little bits and pieces from. So like, that was like a big problem with stock footage before was that you, um, you, I mean, you were always like taking a one little moment and you were trying to match them with other stuff so it had to kind of be oh so this is a complete vignette where it's like it's a total story of of a mother changing a diaper of a baby rather than uh you know just just 10 seconds of a baby with a dirty diaper then a separate yeah. clip of a different baby with with a clean diaper and, you and even to then out. i'm not sure whether or not i think that there's also just like it's a whole bunch of stuff with a baby so it's not just changing the diaper it's breastfeeding it's the baby waking up it's the baby laughing it's you know like all like the the morning of a baby T and TV's so now Egon you can cut stuff in in, in the chat makes a, a i i caught that reference that was definitely a uh, an ed wood reference when he says uh, this stuff is great i could make an entire movie from this uh but yeah uh, and, and that's that's something that andrew did not have when he made that first thing you know <laughs> yeah. there was no like just like uh, you know, super affordable uh uh you know shots of old new york or even new york now that you could you know put a few things in there you know there were some stuff but i didn't want to use it because like i because remember i yeah. had for when we did uh because i'd produced like you know when we did the g4 documentaries and stuff we were using library stuff and things like that for that and i knew we i was you know going through aerial footage and things like this i just didn't i, I just didn't want anything that looked like it was made from stock footage to be honest like that was sort of my thing was like i i i, I think that you can the smart thing is you use a hybrid is you use some you know some stock and some original and you blend it together and then it makes your production values look so much better and it's one of the things i tell like you know talk to like young filmmakers stuff like go shoot stuff and then you know, you can go buy a cool, you know, really cool, you know, external shots of LA that you can intersperse within your thing and your use stock footage to do that. And you can build a scene out so much better. You can do an, an establishing shot out in front of a Chinese restaurant in, you know, San Francisco, and then go shoot the rest of it inside of your kitchen. And people are going to think that you spent way more. You just use that, just the, the right use of it all. Mm. You know, a collage, a tone poem, if you will. <laughs> Gentlemen, do we have pics? Uh, I don't. I don't think I have anything more interesting than what we already talked about. Outside of, um, uh, who boy, Rick and Morty did not like that first episode last night. Oh. Uh, I'll double down on Artlist. Uh, Artlist is great. They have a lot of. I was kind of worried when I first started using it that it would be just like a lot of electronic stuff, but they have a pretty pretty wide range of genres. Oh uh, yeah, Artlist, no, big time. Because that's the biggest thing that I go for. My, my I'll double down on Artlist. Uh, there's a lot of like jazz stuff and and stuff that like when I needed to kind of keep in at least tone aesthetic of the 1960s it was it was very easy to do yeah i uh i actually like the rick and morty and brian my question for you do, you do you ever watch the the inside the episodes they put up right after uh on rick and morty uh 
Yeah. No, no, I don't. And and to be honest, I think I would like it more if I weren't so familiar with uh, uh, Dan Harmon's story circles and all that stuff. Um, uh, like 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 a, diving into all the blog posts and all the think pieces and all that stuff. Uh, it was all familiar territory, and to have it all, you know, have a sh spotlight shown on it and and to paint it red was just a bit uh, beneath them to me. What? Well, yeah, I I. Uh... I, I don't agree with the story circle one. I think it's complete. It's 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 another one of those sort of narrative BS things, techniques or whatever like this. I understand what he says by it, but I'm like, I don't agree with it. And I saw it when he had the circle in there or whatever, but it wasn't, he didn't write the episode. You know, they talked to the guy who wrote the episode oh, and really? stuff. Oh, really? Yeah, no, Harmon didn't write it. So, you know, Harmon sits in a room with writers and says, let's do this. And so some of these, these they bring in different writers for every episode. And so it was, you watch the behind the scenes, you get a lot about how like, oh, well, we wanted to do... We have the, the, the thing they wanted to address was the idea of they didn't want to do another clip show that didn't matter. They didn't want to do a thing that was just, let's throw in a bunch of things that aren't canonical, because that's what they kept talking about. Not canon, not canon, not canon. And so it sort of was sort of an interesting. I would say it's worth watching because it will give you a different lens to look at it and sometimes take it apart. Because I was like, you know, my thing about the heist one was like, I know that like Harmon and Royland are like, oh, heist movies are BS and stuff. It's like, you guys have a formula. I don't know if you know, I don't know if you guys realize it either, but like there is a very specific formula and a heist movie is just like, all right, you know, this formula, now let's get into the characters and a heist movie is often about something completely different than that plot structure. And I would say that to, to the whole, the plot circle thing, I kind of get to know one of my criticisms of it. Like, yeah, there's another thing going on here. That's not in there. That's kind of the most important aspect that uh, I, I, I suppose that's intuitively. the difference between the two is the highest episode is watching a heckler take someone down on stage. And that can or cannot be good, depending on how good the heckler is. Mm -hmm. uh, but watching a heckler immediately turn around and say, also, I'm a piece of crap too. And I'm garbage. And everything I say is a lie. It's like, all right, you're just melting down. And I don't want to see this. Uh, that's not fun for me, which is weird. Cause that's Rick and Morty's MO. Uh, well, it's Certainly Dan Harmon's MO, but uh, uh, yeah. I, I, but 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 again, shining a spotlight on it just wasn't very fun for me. Mm. Yeah, I to me it was like the the, the heist one. I'm like, uh, I love that you guys are really passionate about this. I think you missed the point, but that's okay. It's so delightful to watch you rant, right? <laughs> right. You know, like when when Grandma swears, it's funny. You know, and like is it there anyhow. But yeah, I, again, I would say that it's it's a. Uh, I would say it's a it's a shade of that version of that. But again, I, I love I love just I don't know. I I, I I love to watch a thing and go, I completely disagree with it, but man, I was entertained. Um I think we're all the same way. So uh my pick is going to be um from a technical point of view, I moved into my little office here and I didn't want to go put like all of my podcast gear and everything else here and have the microphone stuff because the thing kept getting in the way. And so I ended up buying um, a much cheaper microphone, which is probably why I sound like crap, but it's been very useful because I got another thing to help with it. So I got the toner microphone. I got this because it had the built-in little mount. It has its own little shock mount here. So when I hit the desk, it's not going to start making noises. And it had the built-in sort of spit screen. So this is, it's like a 50 or $60 microphone, which I like because it's got these other elements. Um, obviously you want to have a really good mic body, which this is okay, but these other elements are just as important. You can have a great microphone, but if it's mounted to your desk and you hit every bump, every keyboard strike, it's going to be bad. And if you don't have the little screen here, then you're going to hear all the sibilation and stuff. So this toner microphone stuff, I think for like 60 bucks is great. And then the other thing, which I thought, oh, like 40 bucks, even better. This is um, the TC777 USB version, T-O-N-O-R. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the one I got. Then the other thing I got, which is super useful, is this uh, USB to uh, uh, lightning. lightning port. Okay, so thank you. So what's great about this is I can plug this this microphone into my iPhone. Hmm. So if I want to do a live stream and I want to basically just, uh, you know, chat away and have a better microphone, just use one of these cables and plugs it into there and you can use that. So that's my pick. So with, you can just improve the quality of what you're doing considerably for not a lot of money now. Cool. Nice. Yeah. The lightning port is, yeah. If you get the Apple one, it's going to cost the same as the whole microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So cool. Uh, is that it? Everybody good? Yup. I'm good. It's been after. <laughs> Brian, did I tell you my, my whole criticism of the whole story circle thing? 
Uh, no, I, a, a, a friend of mine said that it's too reductionist. Um, it's it's so reductionist as to make the the monomyth irrelevant. Uh, but 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 I'd, yeah. I'd be curious on your take. It, it hits the short one is is point to me Han Solo in Star Wars in the story circle. Where's Han Solo's redemption? You know, and where's you know R two D two driving the first? It's like the thing is like the best elements of these bigger stories isn't the hero gets the magic sword and all that. It's the 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 people coming together kind of thing. And yeah. it is, and I agree, it's completely reduction. You lose, and so people have been following the Joseph Campbell sort of myth-making thing for years and trying to write stuff like this and using these formulas, and they're crap because it misses, I think, the most important dynamics, which is great characters, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But Harmon's a genius, and I think he's an example of, like, I say the writers that are brilliant, they don't know why they're brilliant. They sit down and go, well, this is the thing I think about structure. And like, yeah, that was the thing you had to solve, but what you didn't realize is that your gift for timing, your gift for wordplay, your gift for these things is so good, you don't even have to think about it. Right, like, like, like uh, um, the module uh, for witty dialogue is already hard-coded into your system, so you don't even think about it. You're like, whatever, people talk, but the important, the hard part is this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'm like, do I use butt or ass? Which one should I use? <laughs> It's like that's a stupid question. Of course, you know the answer. All right. right. Well, if we're gonna eat, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta shut down the stream yeah. for a second. Good uh, job, team. Thank you, everybody. The guys will be back here in a little bit at the top of the hour for happy hour. Andrew Main on Twitter, Later. Justin R. Young, Ashwood, Rikus. Everybody, have a good one. Bye. See ya.